Welcome to our video on daylighting focusing on aperture area and location. This is an example of a daylit space. One of the things I want to point out is that we typically have different design criteria for view glazing such as this glass in the wall here versus daylighting which daylight glazing which is represented by these apertures in this sawtooth roof. The criteria for good view glazing is typically it's focusing on views towards the horizon plane because that's where the most interesting things are coming in, interesting views are, and the most interesting activities are. Uh, but those are not good places to bring light in. For example, imagine what it would be like if this roof was removed and the only light that we got was through these side walls or these windows. You'd have this terrible glare on the floor you'd have a dark gloomy space where you could barely see a ba basketball flying around. So these represent very poor sources for daylighting. And in fact, they tend to introduce glare because they have clear glass and the clear glass lets that light come in in a blindingly bright kind of way. So this is a beautiful example of a well-designed space in that it has treated the view glazing in a certain way where there are large overhangs and lots of green plants to shade them. And in fact, we've already talked about the fact that east and west orientations are not favorable from a thermal point of view or a daylighting point of view. But one of the best things in the world you can do is give people views in those directions and then protect those views with deciduous trees. And so that's kind of what's being done here. Uh, these trees are not fully developed, but if they get quite large, they'll produce long views underneath the vegetation, and they'll represent, uh, in effect, huge overhangs during the summertime and then during the wintertime if they drop their leaves. They then let a lot of light through, which uh, enhances life in the space during the wintertime. Another example of this sort of dichotomy of one kind of glazing for daylighting and a different kind of glazing for view glazing is this office where all of this down below is for view. It's for the view of this particular person occupying that office. In this case, it's been shown with blinds, um, louvers or something of that sort that allow this person to control the light so that he or she can work on this computer without an excess of glare. Um, and during those times of year when the sun angles are right, these windows can be, the blinds can be pulled up and give really good view. That's particularly nice on the south side. This overhang though becomes crucial to protecting that view glazing. And in fact it should have been drawn a bit longer here because that overhang can be quite long and not interfere with any useful or significant amounts of useful daylight because the primary purpose of this glazing is for view. This glazing up here on the other hand is there for daylighting. It needs to be as high in the wall as we can possibly get it. The ceiling needs to be as high as possible and then to protect this person from the great excess of light that would occur in this office this light shelf is introduced which provides primarily protection for this person, but also bounces light further into the building so that the interior of the core can be illuminated. For people deep inside the building, this actually becomes their view glazing, but its primary purpose is still there for daylighting. Now, we're going to take up this topic of glazing area a little more carefully later on, but for the orientations that we've talked about as being favorable from a daylighting point of view and an overall thermal balance point of view, which is north-facing vertical glass or south-facing apertures, vertical apertures with overhangs, the approximate number I'm going to give you for the glazing area is about 20% of the floor area being illuminated. Now, if you want a very bright space because you have detailed or difficult tasks to do or you just want it for psychological reasons, you can bump that number up to 25%. In certain spaces where most of the people are working on computers, for example, you might want to bump it down to 15%. Also, if you use a lower transmiss transmissive glazing, then you want to increase this area to compensate. Um, 
that's sometimes a good decision to make from a visual comfort point of view because that means that the glazing is less luminous and will tend to cause less visual discomfort. The downside of that is that glass, the glazing system tends to cost more than opaque insulated wall and it has a higher thermal transmittance so from a thermal point of view it's less desirable to do that. So these are trade-offs that you need to think about it in detail but as a starting point for design a good approximate number is 20 percent of the floor area being illuminated. So in this case this roof aperture glazing should be on the order of 20 percent of the floor area and likewise when we go to this you can assume that this glazing is about 20 percent of whatever floor area it's going to illuminate. Now because it's on the side here it can only penetrate so deep into the building and so you need to be a little careful uh, and this is what we're going to talk about next which is where you locate the glass relative to the space you're trying to illuminate but you don't want to make this huge because if you do you'll just overload this portion of the, of the building but not really get the light penetration into the core of the building Okay, so that leads us to our next topic, which is zones of illumination, or at some points I'll refer to something as the primary zone of illumination from a given aperture. And this has to do with the locating of apertures based on zones of effective illumination. So this building, as an example, uh, is based on the principle of zoning, where there's one large aperture, or one primary aperture and then there's a secondary one um, but this primary aperture and by the way this is a little insert right here that I've put on this I'm sorry no it's not this is part of the original space so there's a small amount of light on this side a really big aperture over here which is tilted outward so you can't see it too well but that produces a large amount of light in this space and this photograph might not even fully do it justice. This space was probably brighter than this and the camera adjusted it downward. The idea was this is an entry to the Marbles Museum in Raleigh, North Carolina. They wanted this to be a very social and animated space so they have lots of light here and in fact you even see some beam sunlight splashing across the space. As you move away from the space back into the back, that's where the exhibits are and they want them generally dark so that the exhibit designers can control um, the primary view, but they want enough light so that people can move around. So they've zoned it in a sense that they've put activities in the bright spaces that are appropriate to bright spaces and other kinds of activities in uh, more remote spaces. This is in contrast to this design where instead of saying we're going to tolerate large non-uniformity in the light level and then adjust the tasks or distribute the tasks accordingly, this is a space where the, not, not just the task surface but the entire volume has to be very uniformly lit because people have to be able to follow the path of a basketball flying through this space. So we have fairly closely spaced apertures to assure that the light is uniform even up to the lower level of these beams, the lower edge of these beams. Um, so this entire volume is very uniformly lit. It's a completely different from a philosophy from this one where we have very non-uniform light, here we have extremely uniform light. So let's talk about how light gets distributed from an aperture. Let's got, we have this large space and we have a, a sort of a sawtooth element in the center of it which has vertical glazing at this location. There's very little light back in this zone because none of the light entering the aperture is even headed in that direction. So any light that gets back in here has been bounced off of some other surface. So when we look at the curve that represents the luminance levels, it's this uh, dash dot curve is really low in this zone and it's approaching essentially zero there. So if you were standing back in here you'd perceive that you were in a very dark cave looking out at a portion of the space that's fairly brightly lit. As for, the further you move away from this source the darker it gets here although there's a little more light there than there is there. 
this is still relatively dark by the time you get back in this corner. The real bright illuminance is in this zone right here. And there are a lot of different ways of describing these things geometrically, but we'd like to come up with some kind of simple geometric principle that allows you to figure out what zone you can effectively assume is illuminated by a given aperture. And so what I've done is I've constructed a line starting at the upper edge of the glass. And by the way, this is assuming we have pretty much an expanse of glass across the space. So this is not like a little localized aperture. I'll come back to that point later on with an example. But assume this is a sawtooth that runs the full width of the space, which would be the logical way to illuminate it as uniformly as possible and as economically as possible. One of the things you don't want to do is have a lot of starting and stopping of these pop-up roof apertures because there's additional uh, cost of that surfacing, there's the cost of turning corners, all the waterproofing, all the insulation, but there's heat loss also. So it makes more, and you also don't want to start and stop your apertures because that makes a less uniform, luminous environment. So assume the sawtooth goes all the way across. We draw a line from the upper edge of the glass at a ratio of 1 on the vertical to 1.5 on the horizontal. And where that intersects the task surface, we mark that point. And then we draw one that has a slope of 1 on the vertical and 0.2 on the horizontal. And we find that point again. And we say that's the portion of the task surface. In this case, we're sort of assuming that it's like a classroom or an office or a library where you do your task on a, a desktop or a writing surface that's two and a half feet off of the floor or about 30 inches. We will call this portion the primary zone of illumination from that aperture. And if we understand that this is 1.5 on the horizontal and that's 0.2, then the difference is 1.3, and we're going to call the width of the primary zone of illumination 1.3 times h, where h is measured from the task surface to the top of the glass. Now, you will find different numbers from different people in the, in the research literature, and sometimes people will go as high as 2 on this number as, a point, as opposed to 1.5, I'm putting this in as, as saying this is pretty safe. If you use these numbers, you'll end up with a reasonably uniform light in the space and a fairly high level of contentment on the part of the occupants. But there may be times when you can get away with two, but you need to build models of it or do computer studies of it. And you need to understand also that when you push it into that zone, where you make that 2.0 or especially something as large as 2.5, you run the risk that there are going to be people sitting in relative darkness in that space and their eyes are going to be adapting to the bright spaces right around them and they're not going to be happy. All right, so if we take this aperture and that distribution, we have something called a principle of superposition that says that if we have two of these apertures, we can draw the curve from one of them, which would be this curve right here, and the curve from the other one, which would be that one. And we can add them together, and that will tell us what would happen in that space uh, if we had the two apertures there. And you'll notice we've got a bright zone here and a bright zone there, but it's still fairly dark in between, and it's kind of dark back here. If we have this flat roof there and there, which I have introduced because Often people want it for visual reasons or some other form issue, um, but you need to understand that when you introduce that flat zone, you're running the risk of having dark spaces there and there. Okay, so if we have that philosophy of the principle of superposition, we can do a series of drawings where we have one aperture, two apertures, three apertures, and four. And what you observe is that once you make these triangles cover the entire task surface, this is pretty uniform illuminance. Now, human beings have a hard time telling plus or minus 10% in illuminance level. So you're pretty safe when you get something that looks that flat across the top. 
this is problematical that's a really serious problem this is hopeless but this is working really well so this is how you construct it you basically say here's a primary zone of influence from that aperture and the next aperture needs to be placed closely enough that these triangles touch each other and that's a geometric construction technique so these triangles don't mean anything in terms of illuminance they're just a geometric construction technique that assures that if you follow it you're going to end up with pretty uniform illuminance so again the slope here is 1.5 on the horizontal to 1 on the vertical the slope of this is 1 on the vertical to 0.2 on the horizontal so the effective width of that primary zone of illumination for that aperture is 1.3 times h where h is measured from the task surface which is typically taken to be 30 inches up to the top of the glazing so up until now we've been talking about these roof apertures but also we can put glass in walls usually we put that there for view glazing so for example in this space the view glazing wouldn't need to be any higher than that to give a really decent view, particularly if it's a panoramic view where there are no uh, solid walls along the way to interrupt it. Um, we can continue that glass on upward and this glazing becomes primarily view glazing. And on this side, we've drawn it on the north side so we have almost no overhang um, and we don't need any kind of light shelf inside or um, overhang on the outside in particular. We can put a light shelf on the inside which will tend to make the light in this zone more uniform. It will take some light that would have piled up here and and allow it to come a little deeper into the space but typically on the north side most people don't feel like they want to spend the money on a light shelf um, when it's really not crucial. The other thing is that we almost never put any kind of overhang on the north side because it simply isn't required to block beam sunlight or to reduce glare. On the south side, on the other hand, we want to have overhangs. <clears throat> and our geometry changes a little because when we extend out this overhang, the, the edge of the aperture is at the outer edge of the overhang. It's not at the glass anymore. This glass is essentially moving the light source further out. So when we take this sloped line of 1 on the vertical to 1.5 on the horizontal, it doesn't penetrate as deep as it would in this case because there's no overhang to sort of slide it further out. So in this case, we're showing some view glazing, which is also illuminating into this portion. And then we're showing the sawtooth, which is illuminating from there out. <clears throat> and right now um, there appears to be some conflict between this line and that curb that's not actually a, con a conflict because remember these lines are construction elements that are just defining in a geometric way what's coming from that aperture and this is a close enough approximation that we can use it now we can add some clear story here so that's what we've done here that clear story is allowing an even greater penetration of light from the wall apertures, which is allowing us to make this opaque roof wider. So we might have situations where we want to make this element visually less prominent because we perceive it as a little aggressive or overbearing. So we begin to introduce more human scale near the boundary of the building by putting this flat portion of roof there and pulling the uh, sawtooth back. Um, this also allows us to just get more mileage out of this wall by introducing this clear story. <clears throat> so sometimes we may also have a very high wall in which case we need a certain amount down below for view and then we need some daylight glazing but we don't necessarily want this entire wall to be glass because that introduces too much light and too much heat even on the north side, there's heat that comes in. There's conductive heat. There is heat from the uh, 
from the skylight, even though it's, it's not nearly as intense as beam sunlight. It is energy and it is heat, and you may want to just block that with an opaque element here. So, <clears throat> again, we, we project these lines that represent the primary zone of influence of this aperture in the clear story. We project these construction lines to define the primary zone of influence of this window. These are not rays of light. Those are not rays of light. These are construction lines. And in this case, we're showing a zone here that's getting some light from up above and some light from the window. But this is really good to have some of this light overlapping the zone from the window because the window is going to be really bright right here and progressively less bright there. So this is the presence of the light from this aperture is helping to smooth out the light uh, near the wall. Okay, so here's a superposition of a whole bunch of different things happening in a building. And this is not a bad diagram to sort of print out for yourself or keep as a focus element. Um, here you have a construction triangle that shows the depth of the primary zone of influence from the view window. And then we have this construction which represents the primary zone of illumination from the wall clear story aperture. And then we have all of these triangles that represent the primary zone of illumination from the sawtooth. One, two, and three. And then we have similar constructions for the clear story and the wall on the north side. And again, we distinguish that on the north side there's no overhang, and so the construction triangle starts at the upper edge of the glass. On the south side, it starts at the outer edge of the overhang. Here are a few things not to do. Uh, the first is you don't want to create some weird uh, configuration um, for the clear story, such as, I mean, for the uh, roof monitors or sawtooths. I have seen this done, which is why I'm listing it here. Um, I've seen a lot of things like this done, and I just look at them and shake my head, and I hope that you will shake your head in the future when you see them. But here we have glass, and then we've shoved the back wall, so to speak, of this monitor up close to the glass. So a lot of this light bounces off of that and then comes back out. Um, so this is a very inefficient monitor uh, from an optical point of view and a huge amount of money has been expended to put this up there and then not collect light very effectively. So we have to oversize this glazing to account for the inefficiency of all this light bouncing back out. Uh, and in the end, from a thermal and a cost point of view, this is a very disadvantageous design. Here's a variant where instead of making the monitors narrow, we've made them really wide, which means that the, uh, the passageway for, glaze, for light here is very narrow. And the interesting thing is now this element blocks all the low angle winter light that we were hoping to get to this glass, and we're only accepting the high angle summer light which means that this system has utterly defeated our whole purpose in putting in vertical glass facing towards the south. We're trying to get those rays of light uh, for warmth and heat, and instead what we're doing is just getting overhead light. So we've effectively put in all this cost, and in the end we've created an, an effective aperture here, which is very much like a skylight. So this would be the logical solution where we slope most of the surface. Here we've dished it out horizontal a little bit on the bottom to provide a deeper trough for water. And we've sloped it, or we've set it horizontal for a certain distance here to prevent a really hot spot where light is admitted there. So we've given it a little depth here to let the light come in and play off that surface. We've given it a little extra width there for water. But in general, we've pulled this roof surface back so that most of this low angle light is able to get to that surface. Okay, here's another example of something not to do. These are often referred to as light scoops. And I want to just point out that optics of light and the uh, hydrodynamics of fluid flow are two completely different kinds of physics.
light coming in here and bouncing off a painted surface or a diffuse surface on the back here. Most of that light, or a lot of it, bounces back out. A lot of it bounces all around in this light well and gets absorbed, and very little of it goes down to the interior. These are called light scoops, which is an absolutely stupid terminology because it's unbelievably misleading. They're more like light rejectors. So keep that in mind. All right, so this is what that looks like inside. And it's every bit in reality as abysmal as it looks. And I went and uh, visited the studio spaces on the top floor of this building and it actually took me a while to find the rooms that had the daylight in them um, because they didn't look any different than the other rooms and I finally walked into one space and I said to the students I said can you tell me where the uh, daylight apertures are in these studios and they looked blankly at me because they'd apparently been working in these studios all year long and didn't even realize they were daylit and then I walked into the room and I realized actually I was in one of the rooms that had two of these so-called light scoops and they were utterly overwhelmed in their contribution by the fluorescent lamps. So in other words, they really weren't getting the job done very well. Here's another example. This uh, surface is squared off which makes that surface really bright. This surface gets no direct light so it's fairly dark and this surface gets very little light. So you walk into the space and you're overwhelmed first by the contrast between the brightness of that surface and the darkness of those surfaces. Um, and you're, you're strongly inclined to want to turn the lights on because it feels because of these cave-like elements like the space is not very well illuminated. So I've been in a space like this and, and the instinct of almost everyone walking into it is to turn the electric lights on. And that's true even when the illuminous meter says there's plenty of light on these task surfaces. So this would be more in the nature of what you would want to do is you want to keep these surfaces sloped so this light can get to the walls. And here's an example of a space just like that. This is a classroom and these walls, by the way, are crucial teaching tools for teachers. They want to put artwork and informational sources on the walls in the form of posters and things like that. And basically they're not inclined to do that in a space where there's essentially no light on those surfaces. So one of the key things I would remind you of is the importance of deciding what the task is in the space. We often become preoccupied with what people do on these horizontal surfaces where we write and we draw and we do other things. But walls can somebody, sometimes be a primary task surface where you want to convey information. Sometimes in the modern world you want to convey it with a projector, in which case you'd like that surface to be dark. But sometimes you want to do it with posters that remain there all the time. And if they're not illuminated, that really doesn't help very much. So that concludes our video on daylighting, uh, focusing on aperture area and location.